Hey folks, I'm Tom Basil, and today we're taking a look at the rise of Queensdale. Now, I've already done a first impressions of this, actually. It's been almost two years, I think, since we've done our first impressions of the rise of Queensdale. I played this with uh, Sam and Z, and we never finished a campaign. We went through, gave our first impressions of it, had a good time playing it, and that was that. Well, thanks to the quarantine and everything, I have been able to be to play a lot of games with my children. And so me and three of my children, we went through and played Rise of Queensdale all the way to the end. I really am sorry that I cannot tell you how many games it was exactly because I was keeping track and then I, I lost track. I want to say it was 18 to 20 games that we've played of this. We would play once or twice a week. Um, uh, twice yeah somewhere around that that's how many times we would play and i may do another review with my kids uh to come in and let them give their opinions because i'll tell you what one of them it's a 10 out of 10 and all of them really enjoyed it i did not have to drag them to the table to keep playing this over and over again they loved it but let me give, let me give you my thoughts on it so when this first came out and again if you want to know how the game plays Go back and watch your earlier first impressions because at this point I couldn't even show you the board. It's that, that uh, changed and it, spo it would be spoilerific. And to that point, I'm going to try to be as spoiler free in my review here of this. But this is a legacy game in which you're going to change as the game goes by. It is a dice game. You roll dice and each turn you uh, will use your dice, placing them in different spots. Many times you place them in spots that give you resources, but there's also actions on the dice then you can place those and take a variety of actions. Um, the dice, have, as the game goes by, you will add stickers to those dice, changing the different sides that will show up. Um, and there's going to be things on the board that will also control what's going on. You are going to be consistently trying to build buildings in your area, and you also have somebody who you're running around an area picking up herb tokens. So you play through this game. It is a legacy game. It permanently changes. And when it's finished, you have a game that you can continue to play Sort of. So I'm going to start there. I'm done with the Rise of Queensdale. Yes, we could continue to play the game, but I think that the boards are so lopsided at this point in time that, it, you know, at the end we were very specifically trying to do various things. Each person who was playing, my one daughter won the whole thing. I was in second place and my other two daughters were right on our heels. It was fairly close, but my, my daughter who won, won by a convincing margin. She was in lead the entire campaign. Uh, we got close to catch her, and then she'd pull ahead, and then we get close to catch her. Every kid won the, a game of it at some point, but she won the most. Um, uh, anyway, the, so now that we're done, like if it was my turn, I'm going to try to build a certain thing that was available in that scenario. Now that that stuff's over, our little engines that we built, I don't think translate well into uh, something I want to play over and over and over again. Also, I feel like the complete, the story arc is done. So I have no desire to play this afterwards. You could, but I think they're stretching it to say that you could. Because you could, but it's with a could be not well-balanced setup at the end. Uh, the storyline. My word, the storyline in this is a snoozer from the end, beginning to the end. Look, I get that stories don't have to have swords and sorcery and goblins and stuff, but good night. The queen is sick at the beginning of this, and at the end, the queen gets better. Now, I, I, that, I guess that's a spoiler, but come on now. I, it got to the point where we, we flip a card and I would go, yeah, blah, 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 blah. This is what happens. This is a game that's all about the mechanisms. The story here is as mundane as you possibly can get it. Now, as a legacy game, this story has one extremely main difference in branching. And we went down one branch, but of course I was looking at everything in the game, so I saw the other branches. Okay. To that end, there's a lot of elements in Rise of Queensdale which are negative. There's spots that will be canceled on the board. There's the plague. Different things will happen. Negative things consistently happen over the course of the game, and players have to overcome them. When it came to the branch path that we took, the one we took was 
was good. There could have been a much more negative one, and I felt like there was just too much negative stuff in the game. The kids were kind of like, oh, really, this again? And again, it feels good to overcome that adversity, but I just felt like there was a little bit too much of that as the game went by. There was also a couple things that we thought would pan out in the future and then never did. There was a couple things that happened and then kind of fizzled off. There was a promise of some cool stuff that disappeared. Then the game itself is the same game at the end as it is at the beginning. Yes, they change things. There's more actions. There's more things to do, different things to build and stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, like I said, when I got to game 18 or 19 or 20, whatever it was at the end, I was good. Like, if I never play Rise of Queen's Tale again, I'm fine. I played it a lot. We had a great time doing so. But I think I've seen everything that this game has to offer. I don't play most games that many times, actually. And this one is roll dice, put them out. You can pay to re-roll dice, and there's things you can do to mitigate that. But at the end of the day, you're trying to do your little engine. And all four of us did different things. All four of us had back and forth moments and good times and races and stuff. And the experience, I think, was greater than the actual game being played. Uh, there's a lot of legacy content in this game. All right, so you do get your money's worth here. My word, you get your money's worth. There is a few things as the game went by, the rubbernecking I found to be very disjointed. There's, a, there's one, my biggest dislike in this game, besides the extremely boring story, is that when, whenever you do something in this game, so this isn't a spoiler, in this game there are three main ways to get points on a player's turn. You can build a building, you can build a little uh, herb hut, and you can, uh, you, your morale goes up. And those are different ways to get points. You get a certain number of points for doing each one. If you get to a certain spot on the board, you've reached your goal. Multiple players can do that per turn. And then you've won that game, right? And so then you replace those point totals with higher point totals. You get more points with each, of you, each time you do that, but you also have a farther uh, goal for the, the next game. So, like, for the first game, you need to get, like, 10 points to win. By the time you get to the final game, you need 90 points to win or something like that. Uh, those numbers are slightly off. But at the same time, you get more points for doing things. And I felt that to be almost, it just felt, uh, it felt artificial. So yes, building a building, the points for that go up faster than building the herb hut. So it's not straight up, you need more points, but you get more points. But it did translate to being that. It translated to that being pretty much equal. But the game also gives them extremely strong uh, advantages to the person in last place. And because of that, new stuff in the game only shows up when the person in first place uh, goes higher. If So let's say you're, it's a four-player game. It's you, me, Susan, and Sally. So you win the first game. Oh, we see new content. Sally wins the second game. Well, we don't see new content. Susan wins the third game. We don't see new content. I win the fourth game. We don't see new content. Now, one of us will win the next game, and we'll see new content. And Now, that's not always going to be that way, and you may win, and me and Sally may also reach our goals. So there's, we're going to see new content and three people advance. But if there's any slowness in there and they s deliberately give the person in last place a chance to win games, then it takes a while to unlock that new content. And in fact, I pulled a few strings occasionally for my one daughter who uh, kept losing and rubber banded her even stronger so that she came up and caught up to us. But I felt like the game itself gave the person in last place extra advantages, and then the person in first place, they gave them disadvantages sometimes, but not to the point where it really mattered. And there's a lot of artificial numbers and things in this game that I feel bubbled to the surface, and you can see them, and it, to me it detracted a bit from the experience. So this sounds like a negative review, and it's not. Why? Because this is one of the single best experiences I've had in my life, playing this with my kids. Now, to be fair, Playing a game 20 times with your kids is a fantastic experience in and of itself. And they loved the game. They understood it. I'm raising apparently a very strong crop of Euro gamers. They loved it. They loved the, they didn't care about the story. They liked the mechanisms. They liked building their things up. They loved the discovery of the herb tokens and finding things. And they had this whole system worked out. It was certainly nice to put a game out on the table, 
not have to explain everything. Everyone immediately knew what to do. Or if there's a legacy, I'd be like, here's the new rule. And everyone's like, what? And that experience was fantastic to the point where I'm playing through more legacy games with them now. And like I said, if I had them here and I'll try to bring them in maybe in the future, they would give extremely strong opinions. So that brings up my own rating. But I think the highest for me on a personal level is 7. It was a good time. I don't think it's one of my favorite legacy games. I think it's a good solid one. I think there are bumps and problems with the game. There's maybe a too few many cards. Like I said, there's that weird rubber banding. There's a, The theme is, is eh. But it works, and it feels different from almost every other legacy game that's out there. The only one that's kind of close to it would be Charterstone, I think. And it's a very ambitious project, and it is a success. So if you have a chance to get this one, and I was able to go hunt down a copy of this to go play with my kids, because I already had a copy, but I wanted to start fresh and play with my kids from the ground up, you can go do it. And I think if you'd like the idea of dice placement and rolling things, you will enjoy this. So... Overall, it was a fantastic experience. I'll give the game a 7 out of 10. I give the experience a 10 out of 10. And that's what I think of the rise of Queensdale. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.